Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mohammed Farooq. I head the business for a hospital called Dr. Raila Institute and Medical Center. We are a 450 bedded hospital in Chennai, India. We are a quaternary care center and we are associated with the university. It is my pleasure to give this e-talk at the 5th International Conference on Hospital Administration 2020. I'd like to thank ICHA Organizing Committee, UMY, and the International Conference on Sustainable Innovation for this opportunity. I'd also like to personally thank Dr. L.C. Maria Rosa, Chairman of the Organizing Committee. With that, I think we can start. Uh, my topic today is patient safety in universal health coverage. Give me just a second. I'm going to uh, put my picture down there so it doesn't cover up most of my presentation. What is universal healthcare? Universal healthcare, in short, is defined as a system which can provide individuals or communities with health services that they need without them suffering financial hardship. That's the core of any UHC. All right. Now, UHC has got uh, four major goals. One is accessibility. So any UHC has to be accessible. It has to be accessible to all the people that uh, it's considering. Number two, most importantly, is essential health care. So any universal health coverage system needs to provide a complete uh, health care system, which means it, it will provide health as uh, health promotion to prevention of diseases, treatment, rehabilitation and palliative care. It also needs to make sure that uh, the most significant the causes of disease and death are covered. Uh, of course, it needs to make sure that there's no financial hardship for people who are being covered. And most importantly, quality healthcare needs to be provided. Moving on to what is an effective uh, health coverage system. Now, before we go on to that, I want to uh, show you this uh, diagram that we have on the side here. This small cube here is given by WHO. And uh, this describes the dimensions that one has to consider when moving towards universal coverage. So uh, the small blue box within the cube shows the amount of uh, pool funds that are available for that particular universal healthcare system to use. The breadth here, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but uh, the width shows the population that is covered. The depth will show the services that are included and the height will show the direct costs, the costs that are involved. Now, uh, each are dependent on each other. We can either extend the cover, we can include services or reduce services, and we can increase or reduce cost sharing and fees. Now, we'll come back to this particular chart, but this is something that you need to understand is the core of how a UHC would work. So moving on to what is effective coverage, the fraction of potential health gain that is actually delivered to the population through the health system any health system that we're talking about. There are three major components in this, need, use, and quality. I believe quality pays the major role. All right, so the need is going to be uh, how many people need it, what kind of services are needed. The use is what services do we use? And of course, the quality is the quality of care that is provided. That said, there are multiple ways to measure the effectiveness of care. And it can be measured based on the content, the use, but both of these might not always translate into optimal healthcare outcomes or impact of the population. I want to discuss why quality is the major agenda. In 2005, India implemented a conditional cash transfer program where women were paid to deliver babies in healthcare institutions. They wanted to make sure that the MMR, the maternal mortality rate of the country got better and the deliveries happened in healthcare institutions. Uh, this uh, cash transfer program was called Janani Suraksha Yojana. Uh, there's a study by Bharat Randev et al. which showed that because of this particular scheme, the rate of delivery so it, it went off the roof. However, there was no detectable effect in the country's MMR. This study also indicated that the high institutional birth proportion that JSY scheme achieved uh, was inadequate to improve the country's MMR and they had to wait till the quality of care improved at these institutions, after which they actually uh, got to see a phenomenal drop in the country's MMR. I quickly want to talk about the IHIS triple aim. Uh, most of you must have seen this concept. Uh, the Institute of Healthcare Improvement 
believes that focusing on three critical objectives simultaneously will lead us to better models of care. So these three important uh, objectives are the population's health, try and improve the health of a defined population, enhance the patient experience by quality, reliability and access, and reduce or at least cap the per cost, uh, the per capita cost. Now, uh, recent research has shown that there is one more step to it. I think my photo is uh, blocking that. It's called the clinical, uh, the clinician's experience. Uh, we have to try and reduce clinician and staff burnout. Doing this together with the triple aim will form the model of care that we are looking forward to. What is quality care? The Institute of Medicine in the US has identified six aims uh, for the improvement and to achieve the ideal healthcare system. All right. All these six aims are interdependent. Uh, the most important thing is to form a balance between them so we can use them efficiently. So let's just quickly discuss them one by one. Number one is safety. Care needs to be as safe for patients in healthcare facilities as in their homes. It needs to be effective. We have to match science. Uh, we can neither underuse or overuse the best available techniques. It has to be patient-centered. Uh, the care needs to revolve around the patient. We have to try to include the patient in their own care. It needs to be timely. Uh, patients should not wait for their care. And there cannot be delays in terms of them getting medicine or care. Care needs to be efficient, both cost efficient and also waste reduction efficient. And finally, it needs to be equitable. Of course, uh, disparities in care have to be eradicated and cannot be tolerated. All of this depends on team values, education, training, learning, and of course, the environment. All right, let's discuss about patient safety. Uh, there are many definitions online about uh, patient safety. Uh, but when you actually look at uh, something that's simple, I think WHO and NHS came up with this uh, very short uh, definition, which I think is absolutely appropriate. So patient safety is the avoidance of unintended or unexpected harm to people during the provision of healthcare. We'll also need to understand what an adverse effect is. So an adverse event is any event that results in unintended harm to the patient by an act of commission or omission rather than the underlying disease or the condition of the patient itself. So let's have a look at patient safety statistics. When you visit the WHO's website and try and go through the statistics they have for patient safety, it, it is shocking. A few pointers are here. Let's take a look. So as for WHO, Four out of up to four out of ten patients are harmed in primary and ambulatory care settings, and 80% of these errors are preventable. There are 134 million adverse events that occur each year in hospitals in low and middle income countries, and these contribute to 2.6 million deaths annually due to unsafe care. What's shocking is uh, in low and middle income countries, most of the adverse events are actually not reported. So that number is uh, a scarier big number is what is worrying. Anyway, they've estimated an annual cost of 42 billion US dollars that goes on medication errors. Uh, to quickly go through, one would be that uh, adverse events, uh, unfortunately, is considered as one of the 10 leading causes of death and disability in the world. In high-income countries, it is estimated that uh, 1 in 10 patients is harmed while receiving hospital care, and they believe that 50% of these are actually preventable. Uh, also, about two-thirds of all adverse events resulting from unsafe care and all the years that are lost by patients due to disability or death, they are calculated as something that you say disability-adjusted life years. That comes to about 23 million disability adjusted life years. And this is annually that they occur in low and middle income countries. Also in OECD countries, 15% of hospital activity and expenditure is a direct result of adverse events. That is pretty short. Uh, to have a short comparison of how this stands with everything else, I wanted to put this uh, just to get an idea of how this is. So I got some data out with 
National Safety Council. And uh, I was looking at a comparison of risk. Uh, a risk for somebody to get struck, uh, struck by lightning is one in one lakh eighty thousand seven hundred and forty-six. You, you expect it to be low, but then I put that there because I thought it's as uh, a, a patient error that can happen in a hospital might be as rare as that. Somebody that can die with a dog attack is one in one lakh eighteen thousand odd. Drowning. This is only for people who go swimming, of course. So it's one in one thousand one hundred and twenty-one. Still high. Motor vehicle crash, one in about 111. Now, let's compare that to the data that we have, all right? One in 10 people, as many as one in 10 patients is harmed while receiving hospital care in high-income countries, and 50% of these are preventable. Where does that stand to the list that we're discussing? Also, four in 10 people are harmed in primary and ambulatory care, and 80% of these are preventable. So that's a scary number and something needs to be done about it. I quickly wanted to talk about this because when we're talking about errors, it's important to understand that there are three different types of errors. Uh, there are serious events where somebody loses an arm or somebody is dead. And these are the ones that are usually seen. You know, that's the top of the iceberg. Uh, then there are these near misses where there have been some consequences, unwanted consequences, but they've been prevented because either the patient recovered or it just went away by itself. And finally, there are events that have happened and they've got no harm attached with it. However, there are problems that happen. Now, only if we study all of these can we be able, will we be able to understand and prevent errors happening in the future. So it's the bottom of the iceberg that we need to look at. All right. So I want to quickly uh, talk about the history of patient safety. That's because we all think that patient safety is a fairly new doctrine. I'm sure all of us have heard of uh, the saying, first do no harm, primum non nocere. This is a doctrine as old as medicine itself. You know, frequently, but uh, probably inaccurately attributed to Hippocrates, the wise old man of our profession. When I'm talking about patient safety, I surely think that I should talk about uh, Madame Florence Nightingale, who was not only the mother of modern nursing, but she was also the mother of healthcare design and patient safety. Uh, she demanded ongoing documentation of patient progress, and I'm sure she invented the nurse call system as well. Anyway, uh, when you're talking about patient safety, it's impossible not to talk about Professor Samuels uh, and his early uh, hand washing and antiseptic procedures in the 19th century you know the there was a perpetual fear of one of the diseases that uh, baffled doctors and it was a sure it, it, it was a catastrophe with the mortality rates uh, in excess of 15 percent and professor samuels came in and he introduced his hand washing techniques he had an antiseptic hand wash chlorine hand wash that he did after which the mortality rates fell down to less than 1%. And I think that was phenomenal. Even though it was ridiculed at his time, I think uh, his techniques are brilliant. And even though uh, we still teach these hand washing techniques to our staff at the hospitals today, I'm sure that nobody here can say that uh, they follow the hand washing techniques up to 100%. Uh, I've got a list from the ECRI Institute. Uh, for those of you who don't know, ECRI is a not-for-profit uh, organization based out of the uh, US. They work on uh, patient safety guidelines. They collect data, they collect records of uh, adverse events and uh, what's happened to them from uh, since 2009. And uh, they work on these and year on year, they develop lists and they come out with the top 10 safety issues uh, for that year. Uh, and uh, if you may, we've got the data from ECRI for the last four years. Uh, when you actually review this data, you, you see that uh, most of the items on the list are stagnant and uh, they, they appear year after year. The key events would still be uh, HIT related uh, issues, uh, healthcare and information technology related issues. Uh, you've got uh, antimicrobial and uh, opioid uh, administrative issues. Uh, of course, the behavioral health issues that have been coming up for the last four years. And uh, if you see that uh, the most important thing that I feel here is the adequate systems or processes to improve safety, either leadership-wise or uh, system-wise or 
standardizing safety uh, processes wise and to understand why these remain static uh, why can we not uh, have these sorted out uh, we'll surely discuss them in the coming slides so what is the importance of patient safety in universal healthcare systems one of course is better population health and uh, following that is savings for both the UHC and also for the population a lot of reduction in the out-of-pocket spends and of course uh, it improves efficiency of the UHC more people can be treated uh, if you remember the cube box now if you save more there is a bigger population or more services that we can include and it is more efficient we will be able to help other patients so the number of beds that are there for other patients also increases so what are the barriers to patient safety uh, so don burbeck uh, during the 19th annual uh, national patient safety foundation uh, patient safety congress uh, during his keynote address he gave seven roadblocks to improving patient safety let's quickly discuss them they're very interesting first uh, barrier is displacement by other concerns. Uh, what uh, Dr. Berwick says is that when you walk into any CEO's office or a boardroom, the discussions that are happening uh, are more around the subject of reimbursements and uh, workforce morale. Uh, safety is not uh, top priority here. And uh, even though there's a strong connection between safety and cost reduction, uh, we've still not reached that uh, conviction and it's not yet been established even uh, after 20 years. The second point is going to be the illusion of completeness. There's an illusion that we've worked on safety. Here are the things that we've done. There's been central line infections, there's been pressure ulcers, and here's what's happening on the medication. Uh, let's move on to the next problem. So when... when uh, you treat it as a when you treat safety as a checkbox that can become very dangerous uh, at least it can, it can even be lethal to the patients of the future the third point he mentions is the incentive theory and uh, dr berwick states that uh, until we become scientists and give up the incentive oriented approach to safety we won't make a systemic progress that we've been calling on for years uh, the fourth point being the metrics got. In pursuit of incentives, we've glutted ourselves with metrics. He says that uh, he feels that we are way beyond a level of toxicity and it's not just safety. We have to go on a diet as uh, what Dr. Berwick states. Then we've got system literacy where we have to become literate about the systemic properties and uh, process uh, improvement. The fifth point is separation of safety from quality. People need to understand that uh, safety and quality are not two separate things. Safety is one dimension of quality. And uh, when you're talking about safety and quality, it's like talking about fruits and bananas. The last point that Dr. Berwick mentioned is about academic attacks. It is unfortunate that uh, academic students position themselves outside safety movements, you know, and they become critics really. We need to make sure that they join the, the hospital brethren and make sure that they are part of the safety movement instead of positioning themselves as critics. Now we're going to discuss the possible solutions for patient care. Number one is advocate a policy instrument that contribute to patient safety. You have to develop a patient safety culture within the healthcare facility. Establishing accreditation and regulation schemes. Involving patients in their own care. Participation in patient safety research and AI using AI or artificial intelligence for better safety. Let's have a quick look at all of this. So the National Patient Safety Implementation Framework was introduced in India in 2019. So uh, what the NPSIF was going to look at are these points here. I'm going to quickly just read through them. This is safe surgical care and safe childbirth. That was one of the major priorities. Injection safety, blood safety, medication safety, medical device safety, safe organ tissue cell transportation and donation, biomedical waste management, prevention of nosocomial infections and patient safety research. So the NPSIF is a national institute and uh, 
something needs to happen at the top, mainly at the government level, and it needs to use an approach which is bottom up. The strategic goals of NPSIF are as follows. They want to improve the structural systems to support the quality and efficiency of healthcare. And they want to do it not only at a national, but a sub-national and even at a healthcare facility level. They want to scale the nature of adverse events in healthcare and they want a reporting system and learning from these errors. They also want to ensure a competent and capable workforce that is aware and sensitive to patient safety to prevent and control healthcare associated infections. They want to implement global patient safety campaigns, strengthening patient safety programs across the uh, healthcare industry. Finally, they want to strengthen capacity for and promote patient safety research. So the NPSIF in India, what they did was, uh, this is just an example, uh, most of the countries have their own uh, progressions happening. So what are the provisions of NPSIF? The NPSIF uh, constitutes a national level steering committee as a central coordinating mechanism for safety. All right. They've integrated a web-based grievance system. They also have a toll-free helpline for patient safety. Uh, they've got an anonymous reporting system that can be used by healthcare workers. It can also be used by patients, their friends, families, etc. Uh, they've made sure to incorporate patient safety principles in the Public Health Act, uh, in the Government Act by itself. And they've streamlined this in various insurance schemes as well. They've been able to strengthen quality assurance mechanisms by introducing various accreditation systems. I believe the key element in patient safety is a culture, the culture of the healthcare professionals. It needs to be a just culture. The culture, of course, starts and depends on the leadership. Leadership is the key here. Because depending on how the leadership takes culture into account, the culture forms in an organization. That said, uh, when I'm saying culture, what I'm trying to say is uh, there needs to be continuous reporting in uh, a non-punitive environment. Because I believe the biggest error is not reporting an error. That can be extremely dangerous because we don't get to learn from it as well. One is psychological safety. People need to feel safe psychologically to report an error. It can be their superiors, it can be their co-workers, but they shouldn't be scared of losing their job or role or getting into trouble. They have to report. Second is accountability. Of course, we have to balance safety and accountability, uh, but there needs to be a zero tolerance for reckless behavior. There needs to be good teamwork and communication. Negotiation. Now, uh, any institute which has got more than one person, even two people, might sometimes come to a pass. They might not agree with each other. In such situations, uh, the decisions need not be individualized. They have to sit down, they have to negotiate on it, and then they have to take a decision. That is safer for the patient. And this needs to be done. I mean, they can involve other people, other teams, and you can actually have multiple policies on that. Hand in hand with culture goes the learning system. Now, let's say the, the culture of people here is who cares as long as we are not caught. That's not acceptable. The next level is reactive. Now, when you say reactive, it means that safety is important. We do a lot every time we have an accident, but they do a lot only when there's an accident. The third is calculative. And most of the big institutions, I think, would fall into that category. Well, they've got systems in place to manage all hazards, you know. Now, once you want to move on top of calculative, you try to become proactive. This is where the safety leadership plays a big role and psychological safety also comes into matter. But as you move up this ladder, people become increasingly informed and there's more of trust and accountability, which means uh, the staff themselves or the doctors, the healthcare workers will take up accountability. They're looking for continuous improvement where errors might be made and they work around methods to make sure that they don't happen. Another level on top of that is the generative model, and that's the highest form where people depend on safety as the most important uh, goal in the organization. And they've got models. They keep giving themselves goals and aims to make sure that safety is at the highest level, and then they have to try and overachieve them. 
So that's how uh, that's why we need to get accreditation for patient safety. As all of us know, and there are multiple papers published on this, that uh, accreditation helps improve patient safety. I've taken this image from a paper published by Mate et al., which shows the relationship between a health system financing the accreditor and the hospital or healthcare provider. So the accreditor assesses the hospital and validates it in terms of protocol and standard. The hospital in turn provides better quality of care for patients. The health system will actually provide financial incentives if the hospital has that particular standard of care. Just to give you an example, in India, uh, the central government health scheme or the CGHS pays hospitals that are accredited by NABH 15% more than hospitals that are not accredited. While we're talking on accreditation, I want to quickly also talk about the JCAHO. The Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations has come up with a taxonomy of what errors can be. So they've, they've uh, categorized it based on causes, which are contributory factors or conditions which can cause the problem. The type of error or the problem by itself, the impact or the level of harm, and the domain, which is uh, the setting where the problem has originated from, the staff responsible and the target. To quickly have a look at what this looks like. So these are the causes, as you can see, that are organizational, technical causes and system processes, and they've got human causes as well. The type of error. So the type of error is, is it a communication error? Is it a patient management error? Or is it a clinical performance error? It can be pre-intervention, uh, intervention or post-intervention. And they've got multiple taxonomy here. Finally, the impact. What was the impact of that particular error? It can be psychological, it can be physical, it can be completely non-medical. It can just be a social or a legal error as well. And finally, the domain. The setting in which this has happened, did it happen in an ambulance, did it happen in a, in a hospital, did it happen by a staff, did it happen to a patient, what were the conditions, what's the target, what type of an error. Why I'm talking about this is to understand that when we go through accreditation, all of this is already sorted out. And when you try to become uh, proactive in terms of safety and culture, you can take these up and you can actually work on protocols to try and avoid these errors. Well, they've also come up with uh, a model to prevent these errors. And uh, this is completely adapted from uh, the Joint Commission's 2004 National Patient Safety Codes. Uh, like if you see uh, how to improve patient identification, uh, communication effectiveness, making sure the surgery is right, uh, safety of using high alert medications, safety of using infusion pumps, uh, hospital acquired infections and uh, the effectiveness of uh, alarm systems and uh, related items. All right. The other aspect in terms of patient uh, safety is involving patients in their care. Uh, so there was this guide made for the AHRQ or the Agency of Healthcare Research and Quality. This is a guide to improve patient safety in technically primary care settings uh, by engaging patients and their families. They've given four important points. The first thing is they want patients to be prepared to engage with their doctors where they come up with a list of questions that they want to find out about or speak to the doctors about. And uh, when they come down there, they can discuss all of these with the doctors and they can go back. Uh, most of the patients who did this felt uh, extremely satisfied because uh, they didn't forget to ask what they wanted to ask and uh, they were happy that all of the questions were answered. The second is creating a safe medicine list together. So what happens is the doctors sit down with the patients, discuss the list of medicines that they have. The patients might be taking other medication. So everything is jotted down. You make sure that the list is safe and then it's given to the patient. The third point is the teach back method where something is explained to the patient and the patient or the family is asked to say it again or explain it back to the doctor or the healthcare professional in their own words. So we understand that the patient and or their family has understood what we wanted to convey. And the fourth thing is warm hands off plus. So uh, this is just involving uh, patients uh, in their own care. So when 
uh, two or more people are discussing about the patient in terms of their care. The patient is also involved. The plans are discussed with them. And this has shown a, a huge improvement in terms of primary care settings. When we started involving patients in their care, we found out that they, they left happy and they made sure that they did what the doctors had advised them to do. So they also started taking care of themselves, which was good. This is one of the things that we do. We've got a board like this in our patient room where we've got basic details of the healthcare professionals taking care of them, what their exercise schedule is and the stuff to be done. If uh, I mean, if there's any radiology needed to be done, any labs that have to be done. Finally, we give them a list of things that we want them to do. For example, in this, if you see, uh, we tell them that you need to make sure your tests are normal. You need to make sure that uh, the doctor has okayed your uh, result. So this also increases uh, collaboration, uh, more better communication uh, from the patient with his doctor. They understand what is being done, why it's being done, and they are extremely happy. All right. This is another paper by uh, David Anthony et al., where he's given the taxonomy of errors at the time of a hospital's discharge. Multiple level where errors can actually happen. It's a beautiful paper, you can go through it actually. And he says that these errors can eventually lead to rehospitalization. And when you're looking at universal health coverage, uh, you don't want that to happen. Uh, let me give you an example. Let's say there's an old lady and uh, she's got diabetes and she's sick, but she's got nobody to take care of herself. So she lives by herself, she doesn't talk to anybody and uh, she gets sicker and she's admitted to the hospital. The hospital treats her, she's well, she's back home. But then it's a cycle. She gets sicker again and then she goes back to the hospital. She gets treated and she comes outside. But when you're looking at the system, it's actually not benefited her. You, the, the system has actually put in money to treat her, to make her better. But then, uh, because she's not taken care of herself, because there's no proper communication, multiple other reasons, there's no health gain for the system. Anyway, so this is another thing that we've done at a hospital. We've uh, formulated a discharge bundle. We call it a discharge bundle. So before every discharge, there's a root cause analysis that's done. Why did the patient come here? What were the other issues associated with it? Has something before happened in case of a readmission? What are the associated problems? Then there's patient education. So patient education with us is continuous process. Before they leave, they're educated about what has happened to them, what is expected of them, etc. Then there's a pharmacist review that happens. So a pharmacist sits with them, tells them, describes their medicines and everything to them. And once that is done, they also show how these medicines have to be taken. Then there's an action plan for discharge. What needs to be done? Uh, once they're discharged, do they have to come back? What, what's the action plan? That's discussed with them. Once they've gone, within 72 hours, somebody from the hospital calls the primary care physician and gives them an update about the particular patient so that if they have to go back there, they know what's happened to the patient. We also do a follow-up phone call to the patient 72 hours from discharge. Sometimes when patients are getting discharged, they might not be able to give you that kind of time or they might go home and they might forget a few things. So that is uh, once we've done that, We've been surprised to see that uh, a lot of patients still had a lot of questions that had to be answered. So we, we follow this particular bundle. It's just a suggestion. So patient safety research. Uh, continuous education is extremely important. Uh, we need to make sure that there's a sound evidence for decision making. It, once you start doing patient research, you understand what are the decisions you're taking, why you're doing it. You can actually monitor uh, the impact that you've caused because of your uh, interventions. and. Uh, this also helps in implementing changes and making sure how these changes have been implemented. Uh, WHO has given uh, a few topics here. This is for developing countries, countries in transition and developed countries that they can do about. So these are some examples. There are multiple other projects. The government needs to be extremely supportive of these. The next solution for patient safety is artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is the new end thing and uh, it's absolutely brilliant. Uh, we use some of these models and I'll discuss with you why I'm so excited about them. 
So uh, I'm sure most of you know that artificial intelligence is precise. It's been using, uh, it's been used for diagnosis in terms of uh, radiological diagnosis. It goes through scans. It helps them to understand and diagnose the disease better. They're also using AI and uh, AI associated microscopes uh, and pathology to diagnose diseases faster and better. There are a lot of AI uh, platforms and softwares for operational efficiency, to better understand, better manage the patient flow, and to automate most of the processes. So predictive models uh, flag patients who are sick or who might get sick. It's, it's uh, extremely nice. We are not fully using it at the moment, but we've seen a few samples and it's, it's brilliant. You have to look at it. Uh, we've also got assisted procedures. We've got robots helping us do surgeries and endoscopies. They are extremely efficient and extremely precise. That's our website right there. Uh, we use a tool. Uh, so let's say a patient comes in, but he doesn't know what to do, what he needs to do, and he just puts in a sample. I've just put in a sample down top saying ear pain, and it'll actually suggest you to go meet the ENT. Uh, similarly, uh, if somebody says fever, it will give you a suggestion of meeting the intent, uh, internal medicine diabetology department. Uh, there's a back-end process follow-up also that happens that helps us to connect with these patients better. Well, that's me uh, in our OT with the new Darwincy uh, robot that we've got. We've got the new XI model. Uh, we're pretty excited about it. Uh, it's extremely precise. Uh, it uh, balances out and loses out, cancels out all the tremors that the doctor might have in their hands. And it also helps and assists doctors to go through surgery as to how to go about it, where you can make the next incision. And it's, it's extremely precise. It's, it's beautiful. The best part is it can be remotely operated as well. The other points for patient safety would be enhanced training and supervision of healthcare providers. Now, this is an important point. Uh, I've not got a slide for that because I'm, uh, I think I'm already over time. If you go to developing countries, what you notice is uh, even though the doctors are extremely well trained with tertiary care, the nurses in those areas are not exposed to that kind of care. And that might create a huge problem. We have actually come out recently with a scheme to try and train uh, the allied health workers and the nurses specifically to make sure that quality care can be given to everybody. The second thing, uh, the other important point for patient safety is promotion of systemic record keeping. I mean, this is a key point. I did not want to miss it. I'm not putting a slide on it, but then this is something that has to be given extreme importance uh, at a national level. And finally, I want to talk about improving the availability and implementation of the best practice guidelines and protocols. So these have to be published. People have to be trained in this and they have to be looked at as a God-given book. Thank you. That is my hospital there uh, in uh, Chennai. It's a beautiful place. Uh, it's a nice 36 acre campus. I'd love to invite all of you there. I really hope this COVID situation settles and uh, I can have the opportunity to have all of you guys come visit us sometime. Thank you again uh, and have a good day.